Hello and welcome to the special edition of Elections Unlocked US Special. I'm joining you from New York and we'll be talking about everything that has to do with US elections. In less than 24 hours, America will be voting its new president, the 47th president of the United States of America. While Donald Trump and Kamala Harris are trying to energize their supporters, they present a very different picture of America. Donald Trump is talking about economic revival, while Kamala Harris also focuses on humanitarian efforts. However, when it comes to polls, there is a slight lead that Donald Trump has in the swing states, but Kamala Harris is leading in the national polls. Let's take a look at how the two are faring at the polls. I'm all right. Chest thumping, beating trumpets. Both candidates for the U.S. presidential election try to ensure that their voters remain confident before the 5th November vote. But all I can say is uh, on Tuesday, just go out and vote and we're going to close this thing out and it's going to be party time. It's going to be party time. And this is really all you need to know. Kamala broke it, and I'll fix it, and we'll do it very quickly. So, Michigan, two days to go. You ready? You ready? In one of the most consequential elections of our lifetime, and we have momentum. It is on our side. Can you feel it? the momentum because our campaign is tapping into the ambitions, the aspirations, and the dreams of the American people because we are optimistic and excited about what we can do together. Both promised voters of a golden future. While one talked about tax and price cuts, the other promised to end a war. So with your vote on Tuesday, we're going to fire Kamala and we are going to save America. We will cut your taxes, end inflation, slash your prices, raise your wages, and bring thousands of factories back to America and back to the good old state of Georgia. And I want to say, this year has been difficult, given the scale of death and destruction in Gaza, and given the civilian casualties and displacement in Lebanon, it is devastating. And as president, I will do everything in my power to end the war in Gaza. <laughs> to bring home the hostages, end the suffering in Gaza, ensure Israel is secure, and ensure the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, freedom, security, and self-determination. One thing is for sure that this was a very colorful election campaign and both candidates have been neck and neck throughout. Posters are busy predicting the front runner. At last, Intel's latest poll shows former President Donald Trump leading the predictions, especially in all seven swing states. About 49% of the respondents said they would vote for Donald Trump in the upcoming presidential election, as the Republicans hold a 1.8% vote lead over his counterpart, Democrat Kamala Harris. The survey conducted on the first two days of November included nearly 2,500 likely voters in the U.S., the majority of which were female. A Reuters Ipsos poll published last week on 29th October showed Kamala Harris lead over Donald Trump with the Democrat ahead by few percentage points over the Republican 49% to 46%. The American website 538 of ABC focuses on opinion poll analysis. In their latest release, Harris had had a small lead over Trump in the national polling averages 48% to 47%. Donald Trump, one of the biggest losers. The current Vice President Kamala Harris has led Trump in every Reuters, Ipsos and ABC 538 poll of registered voters since she entered the race in July and built a lead of nearly four percentage points towards the end of August. 
depots were relatively stable in September and early October, but they have tightened in the last couple of weeks with her lead steadily shrinking since late September. While national polls are a useful guide as to how popular a candidate is across the whole country, they are not the best way to predict the U.S. presidential election result. Bureau Report, India Today. Kamala, you're fired. Get out of here. Polls are not sacrosanct, but they are indicators and very strong ones at that. In fact, Carnegie Endowment has conducted a poll in which they talk about how significant Indian American voters have become in these elections. There has been a shift from being blue leaning to the red cap. Rohit Sharma and I bring you this report on how 2.6 million registered Indian American voters are thinking this election. <laughs> With a population of approximately 5.2 million, Indian Americans are the second largest immigrant community in the United States, behind only Mexican Americans. And this election, they want to stamp their presence with their clear demands. हमारे पास दिवाली की छुट्टी नहीं है लेकिन कई लोगों ने इलेक्टेड ऑफिशियल्स ने हेल्प किया तो न्यूयॉर्क सिटी में दिवाली की छुट्टी बच्चों को है स्कूल में हम इलेक्टेड ऑफिशियल्स को उनको तभी चुने जो हमारी माइनॉरिटी को ध्यान दे सके इंडियन अमेरिकन डीपली कनेक्टेड टू द डेमोक्रेटिक पार्टी ट्रेडिशनली बट देर हैज बीन शिफ्ट सिंस ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी According to the Indian American Attitude Survey 2024, published by the Carnegie Endowment, American Indians are high propensity voters. And an astonishing 96% of around 2.6 million Indian Americans registered to vote will likely end up voting in the 2024 elections. The survey found that 57% of respondents lean democratic. 27% lean Republican and 14% are true independents. Using this metric, the share of Democrats has declined to 57% from 66% in 2020. And that of Republicans has risen to 27% from 18%. Trump's record is lowest inflation, highest employment, highest rate of effective earning, not nominal earning, effective learning, earning and no war started by him. I support Trump because Biden-Harris presidency has created illegal immigration. There have been problems created. A lot of people are converging there because they know how important Pennsylvania is. Uh, 19 electoral college votes from the state of Pennsylvania and, and they, they, these volunteers and voters believe that, you know, that they can actually convince some of those independent voters that will end up deciding who gets to the White House. Basically what I was doing is talking to all the different volunteers and making sure that they have minivan downloaded on their phone, which minivan is a platform that allows you to see all of the voters and the person that you're talking to information in a succinct place to allow everything to be there with a script as well to make it easier for the people who are door knocking to make sure it's the most uh, simplest activity that you can be doing. Swing states, um, how the electoral college works here, the swing sway, uh, states kind of decide who the president is. So I live in Maryland, right? So I vote, but I feel like I have to do work in the swing states, right? Mobilize people because their say is going to determine who is going to be the president for all of us. Both Democrats and Republicans have been wooing Indian Americans for election funding. Though Indian Americans are less than 2% of America's population, their median annual household income of approximately $153,000 or about 1.3 crore rupees is more than double that of the country as a whole. And that makes Indian Americans a powerful voting community in this election season. With Geeta Mohan and Rohit Singh, Bureau Report, India Today. Have, have have said, you know, who is going to be better now, for India, right? I mean, people, is it Donald Trump? Is it Vice President Trump? Have said, you know, who is going to be better for India, right? I mean, mm -hmm. is it Donald Trump? Is it Vice President Kamala Harris? What would you like to tell them? 
I'd say that we, uh, if we elect Kamala Harris tomorrow, we will have the first president ever who visited India as a child, who has Indian relatives, who ex- experienced what it's like to really know India from that perspective, not just as a geopolitical ally, but really from the bottom up. I mean, I feel like I have a different kind of sense of India myself. I'm having gone there every few years, talking to my relatives, seeing my WhatsApp with all my Indian relatives on it. You know, you just experience things in a very different way. And I think her added understanding of India from that perspective will be is an unfathomable asset in the bilateral relationship between the United States and India. And I think India will be very proud to have a daughter of India as president of the United States. You know, one last question. I know everybody is going to Pennsylvania. What are you doing between now and results come out? Where will you be? What are you doing to make sure you guys do everything you can to elect her? Well, I'm heading out to York, Pennsylvania this afternoon to get out the vote to canvas. I really think this election is crucial. It's every vote counts and really it's up to all of us. So I, I've been out. I said I was, as I said, I was in Georgia and I've been north to North Carolina a couple of times. And now I'm heading out to Pennsylvania and I'll be in Pennsylvania tomorrow as well to get out the vote and to really, you know, there are people who have some last minute questions, answering every question. We are earning every vote in this election. Kamala Harris is is earning every vote. And so we're all out, we're all out hitting the pavement for her to, you know, really um, grasp this moment. And I think, again, I would just say, I think the election really does boil down to for the Indian American community and for all communities, whether all of our voices will be part of this or whether just some of our voices will be heard. And, you know, we've all lived through periods where there's more bias and anger, and then there's periods where we feel more welcome. And I just think you know, we stand at a moment where Indian American voices will not just be heard, but will roar in this election. You know, I, I did say one last question. I do have one more now. Sure. Uh, How is President Biden looking at this uh, you know, election cycle? I know, you know, he, he made the move. He, he stepped out of the race. What are his thoughts? Because you are an advisor to the president. Uh, I am. So tell us what is he thinking? What's going on in the White House? Give us some details. What yeah, I'm, ha- I'm happy to do that. You know, the president is really proud of the vice president. As he said, you know, he was a vice president. He knows every vice president, every every vice president runs is their own person. She will have her own policies. But I think he's incredibly proud of her. And he wants nothing more than her to succeed. I think he thinks it was a great decision to select her as vice president. And I think he really does. Uh, he's he's uh, first in line as her fan, um, but also recognizes she will have a different president she, presidency. She has a different, she has additional advisors. She's running her own race, and I think that's really um, the position of respect that he has for her. Now, the U.S. election is a very complex and complicated process. Let's just explain it to you in a in a brief. Uh, report by Ishita Mitra. It is a combination of direct and indirect elections wherein voters first vote in their candidates and then on the basis of the votes, electors are decided. It's then the electoral college that really decides and picks the winner. Take a look at this report. clock ticks down to the election day in the US, millions of Americans are gearing up to cast their ballots to choose their next president. But while over 150 million voters may take to the polls, it's 538 electors at the end of the day who will decide who steps into the White House. So how does this intricate dance of democracy unfold? Let's understand. So in America, when you head to the polls, you're not just choosing a candidate, you're also selecting a group of people pledged to that candidate. In this case, it would be Kamala Harris or Donald Trump. Now, this group is comprised of people called as electors. Now, each state in America, there are 50 states, has its own set of electors tied to the popular vote within its borders. And the process of choosing electors is what converts individual choices into a collective decision. So, how do states allocate the electors 
and what is the magic number needed here. Now, this is a simple formula which is tied to the size of their congressional delegation. So, under the Electoral College, all 50 states and the District of Columbia get electoral votes which is equal to their two senators and their number of representatives. For example, Georgia as a state has two senators and 14 representatives. So, this means the state will have 16 electors. And since representatives are based on the size of the population, the smallest states like Alaska and Wyoming get about three each, while giants like California has 54 and Texas has 40 electoral votes. Now, these numbers are dynamic. They keep shifting every 10 years with the census that realigns congressional seats based on the population changes. And the most recent census was conducted in the year 2020, which altered the electoral map affecting how much power is distributed among the states. Meanwhile, Washington district, despite its lack of congressional representation, secures about three electoral votes thanks to the 23rd Amendment. So now, each of the electoral represents about one electoral vote. And these electors vote according to who wins the popular vote in the state. For example, almost all US states follow winner-takes-all system. And where the candidate who gets the most votes from the public wins the support of the electors of the state. For example, if a state decides to vote red, then all the votes of the electors would go to Donald Trump. And in total, there are about 538 electoral votes in play and the magic number is 270 here. This means candidates need a majority of 270 to become the 47th President of the United States. Now, if no candidate receives a majority uh, of the votes, then the House of Representatives elects the President. And this process culminates in Electoral College meeting, which is to be held on December 17. So after 5th November, the other important date is December 17. Now, during this meeting, the electors gather in their state capitals to cast their votes for President along with Vice President. And this meeting, which is enshrined in the US Constitution, finally sets the stage for the official count on January 6, 2025 in the House of Representatives. Another important date for you, January 6. And with the new Congress looking on, these votes will solidify the outcome of this election. And just like that, the next president will be inaugurated on January 28, 2025. So this is the timeline of this election from November 5th to January 28th, which is when the election will conclude. Now, for presidential hopefuls, of course, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, the race is not just about winning hearts and minds. It's also about mapping out a path through the states. Candidates must strategically combine states so they can count on with battlegrounds that hold the key to their electoral success this time. Now, with this race becoming such a neck-to-neck -neck battle, it is only the swing states that will decide who becomes the next president. So the journey to the White House, of course, is a complex puzzle where every vote counts and stakes could not be higher this time. Now, like you should have mentioned, if neither of the candidates is able to secure the 270 magic figure, then what really happens? Uh, it is a neck and neck fight. It is going to be a historical situation if such a case arises. Rohit Sharma will explain to you what happens in such a scenario. The American election is so close that we do not know what will happen, who is going to win this election. But what is absolutely known is the fact that one of the candidates will be taking both right here on the Capitol Hill, which is behind me. And as you can see, it's all lit up and it's all its glory. But there is also a chance, a very outside chance, that this election could be tied. And when I say it could be tied, it could mean that both candidates don't get to 270 electoral college votes. Both can end up getting 269 and 269, which would mean that it has to be a tiebreaker vote. And who's going to cast this tie? breaker vote. Well, the American Constitution has an amendment in place for scenarios like this, for an outlier election like this, where if both candidates end up with 269 electoral college votes, it's the House of Representatives and the Senate that decide who becomes its next president. And in the amendment, it is clearly written that the House of Representatives, which is the lower house, they will elect or select the next president of the United States, while the Senate will have say over who becomes its next next vice president. Now, this is why the down ballot rates in America are also very important in this election cycle. 
from the polling, it seems like Democrats have an advantage in the House of Representative races. So they might be able to come and win a majority in the House of Representative, meaning they could very well end up electing a Democrat as the next president of the United States. However, in the Senate, it looks like the Republicans will have a majority. And obviously, for obvious reason, they will choose a Republican as the next vice president of the United States. And it's never happened in the history of America where there has been a such there has been a tie and then it had had to be broken. But if there was a possibility in modern politics of that happening, that would could very well happen in this very election. That's all in this edition of Elections Unlocked US Special.